excited to introduce two students from Walsh Jesuit High School. So join me in welcoming M. McCooley and Thomas Imhoff. All right, hi everyone. I'm Thomas Imhoff, as they just said. I'm from Walsh Jesuit High School in Akron, Ohio. Right there. Yeah. Um, I'm a junior. I'm the junior class president, and I also swim in my free time. Hey everyone, my name is Emma Coley, and I am also a junior at Walsh Jesuit. Shout out to Walsh again, so for the third time. Um, and um, outside of campus ministry, I horseback ride competitively, so it's very fun. But. Um, since becoming involved with campus ministry my freshman year at Walsh Jesuit, my eyes have slowly been opened to the plagues of problems facing our world. Confronted with so many issues, my personal struggle became not what changes need to be made in the world, but rather what particular issues are God and the Holy Spirit calling me to. This calling was revealed to me through my passions through the issues which I fell in love with and which seized my imagination. My passions grew out of the issues which simply lingered in my mind following each impactful experience I had. And often, I never would have had these experiences if not for chance and circumstance. However, in hindsight, as I'm sure St. Ignatius would agree, I've discovered that these experiences were not governed by chance at all but rather were subtle manifestations of the path which the Holy Spirit has carved for each of us. I discovered one of my passions through an arbitrary breakout assignment at a local teach-in. I was then fortunate enough to be surrounded by others who felt the same passion and the same energy that I felt. We were also lucky enough, or should I say blessed enough, to have had the guidance of those who asked us two questions. What do you need and what can I do? Helping us to funnel our collective energies in order to shape something real and concrete and impactful. This issue for us is the death penalty. The experience which revealed this passion to us was a Catholic Schools for Peace and Justice teaching at St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, Ohio. At the teaching, we heard stories from Sister Helen Prejean Jody Ambrosio and Father Kakuthi. Jody Ambrosio was on death row in my own state of Ohio for 23 years before he was proven innocent with the help of Father Kakuthi. This, along with Sister Helen's stories of working with death row inmates, their families, and even victims' families, showed us a new side, the Christ-filled side, of an issue which we had previously found to be mainly political. Sister Helen Prejean raise such poignant questions, such as, how do we decide who is the worst of the worst? And how would you feel if the worst mistake you ever made decided if you lived or died? Questions such as these illuminated a new path, a new goal, and a new horizon for us to chase after. On the van ride back from the teach-in, the other students and I were full of ideas. Our campus ministers helped us to sort through these ideas and encouraged us to use the many already present avenues that we had learned at the teaching, in particular, the writing of advocacy letters to our local legislators. The idea culminated in a school-wide letter writing and education initiative. Soon, with a bit of digging, we found that there were 13 scheduled executions in the state of Ohio up through November of 2015 and the next man scheduled to die was Stephen T. Smith. The discovery of this name is when my personal struggle really began. Before the teach-in, my view on capital punishment had been passive. I had not really been educated enough to stand firmly on either side of the issue. After the teach-in, it had been easy to be moved and spurred to action by the story of Joe D'Ambrosio a man who is nearly killed even though he was truly innocent. 
This was not the case with Stephen T. Smith. He was nearly irrefutably guilty. In his crime, the rape and murder of a small child while intoxicated could easily be classified as the worst of the worst. Upon learning this, I began to question our course of action. I began to question my personal beliefs and even my church community's view of human life. I began to ask myself, do my pro-life convictions change in the face of the worst of the worst? Do I surrender my ideals to individual circumstance? And where do I draw the line between my political views and God's call? Through much reflection and research, as well as the wise words of others, I thought about my priorities. I began to consider, am I truly pro-life, or am I simply anti-abortion, anti-euthanasia, and other issues in which life is innocent? Do I truly believe in the value of human life itself? Or do I say, human life is sacred if, or human life is valuable when, when it is American, when it is healthy and young, when it is productive, when it is innocent. I began to realize that if I attach these qualifiers to God's statement of human value, I am valuing that particular trait over human life itself. I am valuing innocence over humanity. I had to adjust my frame of mind to say, human life is sacred, period. This process of discernment and ultimate revelation gave me the extra confidence and fuel I needed to begin to share my convictions with others, many of whom would ask these same questions. Our initiative was composed of two sides, education through in-class presentations given by fellow students and advocacy through the writing of lo letters to local legislators. These in-class presentations highlighted both the physical and commercial aspects of the death penalty, those most, used in com those most commonly used in political debate, as well as the theological and philosophical <laughs> aspects of the death penalty. <laughs> Throughout this process, even more people became involved than we had ever imagined. Students developed and delivered presentations. Teachers set aside class time for discussion and debate. People were willing to write their own reflections and to read examines, and substitute teachers who came into the school even became involved. This was a consequence that we had not foreseen when we had planned to simply ask students to copy form letters. We, ignited, we had not expected the incredibly passionate and widespread response that we were given. At first, the passion of the people, those who stood on both sides of the issue, was honestly very intimidating. Calls from parents, inflamed emotions, and heated lunchtime discussions. None of this was expected, yet somehow we achieved it all. Full of energy, as we were in our van ride, we had initially set a quantitative goal, writing 1,000 letters to send to Columbus. However, as time went on, we had to adjust this goal, soon dropping to 500 letters, then to 200 letters, then to 100 letters, finally to 60 letters. Only then did we realize that the simple value was in the speech and the discussion of the education of our fellow classmates. Our first goal had been in numbers, and to be honest, these numbers disappointed us. Only 6% of the student body? We then understood the most important achievement was undeniably conversation, the beginning of a group discernment process. We got people talking teenagers to talk about serious life issues during their free time, in the hallways, in the commons, in their lunch periods. We realized that if people had simply signed postcards, unthinkingly, blindly, these would have had no value. Our overall conception of success had changed. We did not achieve the outcome sought, but an even better and more impactful outcome was revealed. Rather than numbers, our campaign came to emphasize the importance of having an opinion, of being passionate no matter what side you're on, and the many dangers of being passive. In addition to educating me on a very important issue in my life, this experience taught me that I alone cannot conquer or save the world. 
Instead, I must follow the torturously narrow path being carved for me by the Holy Spirit. At times, this, pa this path is hazy and seems too hard, too long, or too futile. I encounter, and will continue to encounter, challenges and obstacles. Some turns or bumps I encountered in this part of my path took time to discern, while others I glided by spontaneously with the help of encouragement from others, only realizing how much I had changed and how much I had grown and overcome when looking back on the path behind me. Throughout this process, nothing occurred by chance. I simply had to realize and recognize the Holy Spirit's movement in my own life. I had to be willing and open to inspiration from others' stories. I had to be willing to allow others to join me on this journey and to do some path carving of my own. Finally, I hope that just maybe my story may empower others to think, reflect, and do the same. I too found that the culmination of this experience opened my eyes to issues that I had been unaware of for years, and it helped me to embrace a passion that I had been blind to in my own life. Beyond us, our collective passions and energies had inspired others to act, and this was a source of hope for us. We hope that others will be inspired to find their own passions, the issues which bring them joy and fulfillment in their own lives. My personal journey amidst our efforts forced me to reevaluate some of the core beliefs about the dignity of human life, and I had to ask many difficult questions about why I was supporting something so countercultural, something so seemingly wrong in the eyes of so many, yet why I was doing it with such passion. Through much prayer and self discovery, I determined that this was a passion of mine, it was a true calling and that I was able to grow deeply in my faith through all the hardships and the roadblocks of our campaign. Apart from personal enlightenment, I found that our efforts had affected so many people in ways that we could have never imagined, by igniting passions on both sides of the issue and fueling discussions, discussion that we had previously envisioned as impossible. So as our story draws to a close for now, we want to leave you with a quote. If there is no passion in your life, then have you really lived? Find your passion, whatever it may be, become it, and let it become you. And you will find that great things happen for you, to you, and because of you. Thank you.